Welcome back, everybody. Like I said yesterday, Chili is the grift that keeps on grifting. Today, we have yet another phone call from jail, and it turns out that he's elevating the scam to new heights because now he's not content with $25,000, but he actually wants $50,000. So first, we'll take a look at the new fundraiser that he put up, and then we'll put the new phone call from jail uninterrupted without commentary, and I'll give my thoughts at the end. And that brings us to the sponsor of today's video, Aura. If you've been part of the community for some time, you know that we have a serious problem with frauditors doxing viewers. Especially last year, we had issues with frauditors going in the comment section and attempting to reveal private information of people that were supporting the anti-frauditor channels. They were revealing private information such as names, addresses, and date of births with the intent to bully and intimidate. Luckily, now we have a solution to prevent that from happening again. Aura automatically scans the clear web and the dark web for any mentions of your private information. If your private information is located, it sends a removal request on your behalf to keep your identity safe. Aura gives you access to an identity plus credit monitoring, a password manager, an antivirus protection, a military grade virtual private network, home title monitoring, data broker removal, all for the low price of 12 bucks a month. It's a one-stop shop for your digital security. And the best part is that you can now try Aura for free with a 14-day trial with my link that's available in the description and in the pinned comment. If you live in the United States and you wanna protect your identity and at the same time help the channel, use my link in the description. Now back to the video. So let's talk about the first scam fundraiser. So Chili set this up about two weeks ago, and this was supposed to be for all frauditors. So you would donate money to this, and then Chili would appropriate the money to the lawyer of the frauditor, to whoever he seems fit. You know, really, really transparent stuff. But anyways, that's what it was. There was a couple thousands in there. Now, yesterday, when Chili did his e-bagging, he said, I need $25,000 for an appeal lawyer. And I'll talk in just a moment how that's a total scam. So now he appropriated this fundraiser for his own purposes. And he raised $16,123. So which was 6,000 above the original goal. So that's something he requisitioned for himself. But now he's not happy with that anymore. He realized, hey, if I'm going to do some time in jail, I'm going to squeeze these dumb motherfuckers for every dime they have. So today he set up this fundraiser who is also asking for $25,000. So there's going to be a confusion here because viewers that are going to watch yesterday's live stream are going to donate to the other fundraiser because they hear Chili asking for twenty five dollars Meanwhile, he's also asking for twenty five dollars on this fundraiser. So right now, he already raised 4000 He's easily going to squeeze at least $40,000 to $50,000 out of these morons, these imbeciles that don't realize they are getting conned. And this is why they're getting conned. He's asking for this money for an appeal lawyer. First of all, an appeal for a misdemeanor is ridiculous. Yeah, he might find someone to do it, but it's not even going to make a difference because by the time the court system processes the appeal and finds out if he's right or not, he's going to be out of jail anyways. Take a look at DMA's case. DMA was found guilty, I believe it was in September or October, and to this day, at least six months later, he still hasn't gone through the final process of the appeal. It's still pending. So if his dumb subscribers really think that Chili is going to be able to hire a lawyer for the appeal and get all of that sorted out in the next couple months so that it's not even remotely pointless and he gets a little bit of time off his sentence because the appeal is successful, if they really think that's possible, then they deserve to lose their money. They are complete idiots. Of course, Chili knows that's not going to happen, but at least that way, he'll have a nice little paycheck when he gets out of jail and says, well, you know what? Thank you for all the money, but I'm out of jail now, so I'm just going to keep it. And you know for a fact that's what's going to happen. Now that we discussed the scams, let's take a look at the newest e-bagging pathetic phone call from jail. Okay, a lot of people are saying it's good. Okay, here we go. 
to accept this free call. Press 1 to refuse this free call. Thank you for using Securus. You may start the conversation now. To Team DLZ, today is Sunday, March 24th, 2024. This is officially my fifth day in jail. I want to explain to you how this place works a little bit. So when I was intaked from the courtroom into the jail, they put me in the torture cuffs and the bailiff who I had called the pig put the torture cuffs on nice and tight. And you look at the room that's dark oak and robes and deep red overtones in the room. And ironically, just less than 40 feet away, there's a door that leads to the dungeon. And when they open the door, it's all white with a stripe that goes around the room. And the room's 12 feet by 8 feet deep. And they put you in there on the toilet. You look around and there's nothing there but you. And then maybe a minute later, the two bailiffs came in and immediately began to pat me down briskly as though they were giving me a terrible massage from my ankles up to the top of my hair. Their hands are coursing over my body and... They're feeling every single inch of my pants, my suit jacket. They begin to crumple it and pull on it and twist it because I'm already in the torture cuffs and they're tight. And I tell them, please, the torture cuffs are are tight. We don't have to like each other, but you don't have to torture me. And he says, you'll be out of them in a minute. And then he says, I'm going to bring your lawyer in. They leave as quickly as they came in. And then the lawyer comes in and Michael Mee, his face is red and he's disoriented. And I look at him and I actually say to him, so... I'm going to shock and at the same time, then there's a chain and then you, they walk me through and they say, let's, let's switch him up. So then they bring me over and they take the torture cuffs off. They say, take off your jacket. I take off my jacket and then they say, all right, take off your shoes. I take off my shoes, one shoe, one sock. And then they, they take a flashlight and they look at my feet and they, and they roll my pant leg up and then they, they take me from there and they, now they say, take off your overshirt and just wear your, wear your overshirt, get rid of your white t-shirt because it's going to be cold. And then I'm wearing my slacks and my button-up white dress shirt. And then they take me over to medical and uh, they take my... At this point, the live stream cut out completely. You know, fraud auditors don't have the best technology because, you know, they are investigative journalists after all. And Brian tried to go live three more times. He was successful to go live for a minute 44, three minutes 28, and 39 seconds. So after three failed attempts, he decided, fuck it, I'm just going to go live on my own channel, and this is what happened next. So then they, I take off both shirts, and then I put the button on, the white button up. My, my suit pants are fairly new, so my shirt's brand new. And so then I'm just wearing orange, like, water shoes, and then I'm wearing my slacks and my button-up white dress shirt. And then they take me over to medical, and... Uh, they take my blood pressure and my blood pressure is 170 over 110. And she says, well, do you have high blood pressure? And I say, I I used to, I took care of it. I said, isn't that pretty high? And she said, it's not so high understanding the circumstances. And then I, I say, understanding the circumstances. She says, yeah, in the situation that you're in now, it's, it's, it's expected your blood pressure is going to be a little high. And I said, but isn't that really high? She said, you'll be okay. And then, they take me from there in shackles and they sit me down on a bench and then they shackle me into a chair and then I have to sit in this chair and then I look over to the other people and I say, hey, was your blood pressure high? And they say, yeah. And I said, did she say to you, it's, it's, and I asked multiple people and they say, yes. And then I go into a holding cell and I'm in this holding cell. I get in there maybe around three or four o'clock and I'm in this holding tank until four o'clock in the morning. You can't, you, you can lay down, but it's freezing freezing cold and so then I'm in the holding cell for 12 15 hours I don't know how long and then they say you're transferred upstairs and I go upstairs and now this is a room it's a big room like a big auditorium room there's there's stainless steel tables in the middle with stainless steel stools that go around them and there's probably four of them and there's you know six or eight stools at each table so there's you know maybe 50 people considered these four tables and around the room are doors I don't know where those doors lead so Now, at this point, I have to take off all my clothes, drop them into a bag, and then walk into the shower area. And I go into the shower, and the guard tells me, go in there and shower, drop all your clothes outside, put them in a bag. And so I do that. We don't put them in bags, I go in the shower. And then they come around, they take the bag, so you're buck naked in the shower. And then I take a shower, and then 
guard comes around. He says, all right, open your mouth. I open my mouth. He says, all right, turn around, spread your butt cheeks, squat, and cough. I don't. I just turned around, tapped the butt sides of my butt cheeks, and, <laughs> and the guard was about 70, and he's like, good enough. And then uh, I come out. They give me a pair of these. I'm wearing the exact same clothes that I put on Tuesday night or Wednesday morning. Then this is called isolation for 24 to 48 hours. It's rooms of one or two people. For me, it's going to be two. And so I I go to this. He says, your name, DeCastro, inmate number. I now have it memorized, 1669561. And then I go, and he says, you and you go to room number 37. I'm walking to the room, and the guy next to me passes me. And I think, I guess he's in a hurry to get to the room. We walk into the room. He goes to the two bunks. He grabs the two mattresses, looks at them, picks the mattress he wants, puts it on the bottom bunk, and then throws the other one on the upper bunk, then takes the sheets we got and the blanket, quickly makes himself a bed, gets in the bed, and puts the covers over his head. <laughs> it was kind of like a surreal moment. I was like, all right. So then I said, hey, man, I'm chilly. Nice to meet you. He said, Nick. I said, man, this is hell. And he said, not as bad as war. And there's a metal stainless steel shitter there, and on the back of the shitter is a drinking fountain. And that's the water you're going to have to drink. I'm there for maybe two minutes, and the door comes and opens. I'm taken out of that cell, and I'm putting in room 23. And I remember thinking it was Michael Jordan's number, one of the largest investors in prisons in America. This particular room doesn't face the sun. It faces another building. So I'm grateful for that. So I take two matches. I lay them down, and I lay down, and I try to sleep, but I can't. So I start to do stretches. I'm doing stretches and counts of 30. I do every single kind of stretch I can do. I'm pacing back and forth. I stretch. I do 200, 300 push-ups. I do head handstand push-ups. I do burpees. I do mountain climbers. I'm doing anything I can. I'm alone for 10 or 11 hours now and no stimulation. They bring food to the door, drop it off, close it. All right, you guys, are you, you're telling me it's buffering again. I, I don't mean as such viewers will be experiencing buffering. And this is where it cut off again. He's having more technical difficulties, not able to play the audio. But, you know, someone that would have more than two brain cells would realize that, you know what? The live stream isn't working right now, but clearly I'm able to go live. Why don't I just post the audio to the channel as a video on demand? That's not what he did, but after a couple more attempts, he was finally able to get it to work. So here is the rest of the phone call. I do head handstand push-ups. I do burpees. I do mountain climbers. I'm doing anything I can to get the time to pass. It's just dripping by so slow. And so then I, I go over to the mirror and I begin a, a set of positive affirmation. It's hard to tell you guys, but it's true. And I'm coming apart, you know. I've been in this room alone for 10 or 11 hours now and no stimulation. They bring food to the door, drop it off, close the door. No stimulation. It's, it's called lockdown. So you're stuck in this room. So I, the food is atrocious. I had been doing Ramadan up until that day. I had blown it one day in L.A., but I was trying to get back on track. And I, I was back on track. I was doing well. I, I had breakfast before the day started on Tuesday. So this was now... I don't know. I don't know. I've lost track of time. Maybe Thursday morning, and so I now go over to the to the to the window and I'm to the mirror and I'm giving myself positive affirmation. You're okay. You can get through this. You're okay. You can get through this. You're a good person. You haven't broken the law. You haven't done anything wrong. You're. This is going to be hard. But you can get through it. And, and it's just so hard because you have no other stimulation. So then, at about 15, 16, maybe 17 hours. I don't know how long I've done sets and sets of stretches, counting to 30 sets and sets. And I'm just trying to, I'm more flexible now than before I went in, but I'm just trying to get through it. And then at that point, they bring in a group of guys. You can see them all sitting at those tables I talked about initially. And there's maybe a dozen men there. And I look over the dozen men, and there was a, a black guy who I'd been holding with named Roy. And I literally said a prayer to God. Please, dear God, give me Roy. Please give me Roy in this cell. If there's anybody, because there was another guy in there who was about 22, 23, who came in the holding cell, and he was just so loud. I'll tell you what, I got, I got five kids, five kids. We send them to school at 5 o'clock in the morning, every morning. And this guy's talking as though he's on a pedestal giving a speech to people in a, in a holding cell that's 15 feet by 10 feet wide. That, that, that It's horrible. And so I'm praying that I get Roy, and you know what happens? I get Roy in my room. Roy is a guy, he's 56 years old. He's been arrested on a 25-year-old warrant for attempted auto theft, 
from 25 years ago in 1999 when he had a relationship with a woman that went sour. And then when they were breaking up, she called her car and stole it. And then he left town and never came back. Left Her car was in her driveway when he left. But since she called it and stolen, she, he then had to, had to face a felony warrant. Now, here in the state of Nevada, they do what's called a DNA test. So he had a mandatory DNA test because he was charged with a felony. Well, the mandatory DNA test makes it so that you have to be held for at least three days so they can get the DNA test through the lab. But remember, there's three uh, video, please. in Nevada. Okay. There's mining, there's casinos, and there's prisons. Mining is the least successful. Casinos is number one. The number two industry in Nevada is prisons and jails. So the DNA test that they put through, through the state legislature here in Nevada means that they can hold you for three days, meaning that the each jail prison that holds you for three days can build a state for three days, at least of DNA testing. So that's why Roy is being held, really. He's being held because it's going to be a financial boom for the jail or prison industry. If the cops charge you with a felony here in Nevada, it's a mandatory DNA test. Now, remember, I don't have a computer in front of me. I'm just going by memory. So Roy is in my cell now, and I've been in the cell alone for 16, 17, 18 hours. I don't know how long. I can't keep track of time. There's no clock. Roy gets in my cell, and I immediately begin to chatter to him like a school kid on a playground. I talk for 10 minutes straight. Finally, I say to him, Roy, look at me. Nobody will look you in the eye. None of the jailers will look at you. You're, you're treated like you are cattle with a dollar sign on your back. It's not that the guards are cruel. They're indifferent. They don't care. They don't give a damn. You have to follow a system, and they are flowing you through, and this is the money for the state of Nevada. And if you in any way, shape, or form get in the way of that money, they will deal with you. Under the 1980 case of Johnson versus Glick, the guards are to maintain order, and they can use reasonable force, objective reasonable force, to maintain that order. Now, here in this particular jail, they have banned the chokehold, and they've banned the chair, that torture chair that we see in so many videos. So now Roy is in there, and I finally tell him after 10 minutes of me talking, I say, Roy, please look at me. And he finally looks at me, and I say, man, connect with me, bro. Talk to me for a minute. And in that moment, it's the first human moment I've had in over 24 hours. And I immediately break down and tell him, I shouldn't be in here, Roy. And, he, and, he, and, he, and then he, he says, neither should I, man. And he's, he's, this is a, an, he's an only child. He's, he's a black man, and he's a strong person. And he says to me, Chili, you, you need to be strong, and you need to hold it together. I said, I'm going to hold it together, but for the love of God, man, we need human connection. If we don't have human connection, we are going to fail in here. And for the first time, Roy says to me, I know it. He says, damn it, I know it. And then he starts to talk, but he hadn't said a word. He just was all locked up inside. And then for the next maybe 30 minutes. So now this is really incredible what I'm going to tell you right now. So for 30 minutes and I, Roy and I have the most human conversation you could possibly imagine. We talk about everything from our childhood to where we were raised to why we're in this dungeon and what the next process is going to be for us as we go through this. And so now there's only one toilet in there and there's a sink on the back of it. The water tastes like rusted pipes. It's horrible. And the toilet is stainless steel shitter is on the bottom of it. And when you drink the fountain water, it drains down into the toilet. Roy is a big flusher. He likes everything to be flushed. And so, you know, he has to spit. And so he's spitting. He has high blood pressure. His blood pressure is reading 190 over 120. He should be hospitalized, but he's not. And so we're in this room together, and now we have to have a conversation that no two men should ever have to have. And I say to Roy, I say to him, hey, listen, do you have to use the bathroom? And he says, actually, I do. I need to use the restroom soon. And so then I, 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 we're, at the, we're at the bottom of the pit of despair where neither one of us should actually be in jail at all whatsoever. Roy doesn't have a real criminal record, and I don't have any criminal record. They look me up here, all the guards have, and I don't have a criminal record besides being before 21 years old. I'm 49 now. So I say to Roy, listen, if you have to use the restroom, just let me know, and I will plug my ears, and I'll turn away. And he said, and I'll flush right away as if I have to use the restroom. 
And then we say, you know, I say to him, I, I say, I'm. Yeah, and that's also a good point. PC, PJC Net says it would have been suspended if he'd behaved in court. And, you know, quite possibly it would have gone different if he did behave in court. Possibly. But, you know, people are always saying, well, look, if you if you comply, nothing's going to happen to you. Well, tell Daniel Shaver that. He tried to comply with every single command from Mesa police officer Philip Brailsford. And where did that get him? Dead. Look at Philando Castile. He was, he was in the process of complying with that Minnesota police officer when he got seven holes put inside of him. He was, he was reaching for his concealed carry permit. So, you know, there's some, there's some interest instances where you can comply and things go okay for you. There are some instances where you comply and things, it's curtains for you. You're done. It could be that Chili could have crossed his T's and dotted his I's and said everything right in the eyes of the, the, um, the, ty- the tyrant in the robe, but he could have also gone to jail because she knew about his YouTube channel and she knows the disdain that he has for power tripping, power drunk, authoritarian psychopaths and badges and guns and uh, could have gave him the, the ax anyway. The bottom line is no, no lawful order was given. No law was broken. No crime was committed. No victim was created. That's the bottom line. Now, all you trolls out there, if you believe that Chile deserves to be in jail, and I believe you deserve to be in jail if you create a victim too, depending on the survey, depending on the severity, did you steal a candy bar from this family shop? Or did you sucker punch an elderly person at a bus stop or gas station because, you know, you're trying to be initiated into that gang? Or did you put a bullet in somebody's head who didn't deserve it? You know, it depends on the depends on the severity of the crime is where we determine the severity of the punishment. So yeah, people that harm other people, people that damage people's property, people that you know unrepentantly continue to do wrong to their neighbor, they deserve some jail time. But if you didn't create a victim, you really deserve to go into a cage and be humiliated and demoralized like this? Well, make your case. Let's hear it. You know, you, you can continue with the, the little ad hominems and you know 30 percent goes to youtube and 20 percent goes up chili nose okay prove it prove 20 percent of what he makes goes up chili's nose prove that you know accusation without substantiation is the height of ignorance and you are showing yourself a real fool when you make a statement that you can't support so go ahead support your statements if you can't you're a fool sorry to tell you this but it's just a simple fact when you go to the bathroom you have to go poop no other man should have to listen to another man crackle and pop as they take a shit in a toilet. No, 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 nobody should have to, to listen to another man crackle and pop as they take a shit. And we both laugh for the first time that we've been in there. We both laugh and say that is the most honest thing I've ever heard. And I say it's a pet peeve of mine when I go into these restaurants restaurant stalls in the bathroom and uh and they don't play music in the bathroom you have to go to the bathroom but there is a sound to going poop and he says yeah there's a sound to going poop there is as gross as it may be unfortunately when you're put into a situation like we are you have no choice but to talk about the most human of function the most the despair of explaining to another person that they shouldn't have to hear you go to the bathroom. And that's what we have to talk about. And so then it's maybe 20 minutes after that. I don't know because there's no way to keep track of time. You're looking out the window for people who are coming in. But if you look out that window too long, a little tiny window, four inches wide by maybe 24 inches tall, and the, the guards do not, there's a button there that you can push a light. And if you push that light, you're going to be, you may don't push the light. Unless it's a medical emergency, you don't push that light. Because there's only one guard out there. And it's a great big, huge auditorium with those 50 seats I told you about. But we're on 24 to 48 hour lockdown as we're processed in. And I'm literally losing my mind inside of this room. 
And so Roy says to me, okay, Chili, I, I have to go to the bathroom. And so at that point, I get on the lower bunk, I plug both my ears, and I start to hum, hum, with my ears plugged, because I really don't want to hear another man go to the bathroom. And then I hear the slosh of the toilet. It's like a, it's like a tornado. It's like a hurricane inside of a stainless steel can. And then I hear a moment later, and then I'm still humming. And then I hear Roy say, hey, man, you can stop humming now. And, and, I, and so I unplug my ears, and I turn around, and he's gone to the bathroom in maybe a minute, maybe one minute. Now, every man over 40 years old knows that when you go to the bathroom as a man, you sit down on the toilet. Sometimes it's even better than sex to sit down on the toilet when you're over 40 years old to let your bowels relax and you can sit there and take a shit. And I hate to be so crude, but this is the actual process of the dungeon, and you need to hear it. You need to hear that there's no decency, that every bit of pride is stripped from you, that you are broken down to the most disgusting level that you could possibly even imagine, where you have to talk to another man about how you're going to go to the bathroom in front of him. And so he goes, he gets up, and then... He says to me, let me know if you have to go. And I, I say, I've been limiting my food intake. I've, I've been eating very tiny portions, and then I've been working off the food. So I haven't had to go to the bathroom. So now, after that, maybe I don't know how many minutes, hours, I don't know. But then the guard comes out to the middle of the auditorium and starts to speak. And he says, listen to me. Everybody come to the glass. And so Roy and I go to the glass, and he says, do not push the light on the door. If you push the light on the door and it's not a medical emergency, I'm going to come in there and get you out of there and lock you down. Do you understand? You think this lockdown's bad? It's not going to be a tenth of what we're going to go through if you push that light on that button, on that door, and it is not a medical emergency. Now, I'm going to serve food. When I come, when I come to the door, you are back by your bunks. We will drop the food off by the door. You can come to the door and grab it after we are gone. Do you understand? Knock on the door. So we knock. It wasn't a knock. It was something else. I don't think he said that. I don't think he said knock. I think my brain's just filling in holes. But I don't think he said knock. I think he just said, do you understand? And that was it. He didn't want any communication back from us. My brain is just, I'm, I'm trying to remember everything detail by detail, but it's all the days and nights are run together. I was arrested on Tuesday afternoon. I think today's Sunday, 24th, and, and I finally last night slept for the first time six hours straight. Before that, it was an hour here, two hours there, an hour here, two hours there. So then a little bit of time passes, and then they say, um, then they, 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 they call names. They call my name to Castro. And so then I go out, and we all go down to the table. He says, you're moving cells. You're going over to this holding cell instead of the one you're in with Roy, 23. So I grab my blanket. I grab the mat I was using, and I grab my pillow, and I bring everything over to the other bunk, to the other holding tank that's the same, five and a half feet by eight feet. Now, when I do that, I have two mats. Okay, here, here it goes. Now, the guard says, you have... You guys have 15 minutes to use the phones, and then we're, we're leaving here. And so then he goes, everybody back, lock down, get on the tables now. And he goes to Castro. He goes, you have two mattresses in that bunk over there. I said, you, you know, you told me to grab everything and bring it over there. He said, not the mattress. Everybody will stay locked down until the Castro gets both mats over there. Uh, now I start to run, and the guard says, no running. So then, I, then I'm just double-stepping up the stairs. I grab the mat. I get it back. The entire room is grumbling my name and mad at me. So then I get over to the phones, and I look at the guys, and I say, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Don't let them divide and conquer. And the guys in the row all immediately agree that they're not going to let them divide and conquer. But then it's, this is the last holding tank before the next step is I'm there for maybe... 20 or 30 minutes, I don't know, because you can't keep track of time. And then they say, let's go, you're going to general population. So then they take me out of there, and then I walk back outside, and there's me and maybe six other guys. And then that group of six connects to another group of six that connects to another group of six. And now they're walking us down corridor after corridor after corridor. You have to walk along the line of the outside of the wall, keep your head down, walk along the wall, don't look at me. 
Put a one in the room if you've spent more than a day in jail, more than 24 hours in a jail. Put a one in the room. Look down, and I'm walking down the down the, the line. Then they put us in an elevator. Everybody has to walk to the back of the elevator and look at the back of the elevator. If there's someone in front of you, you look at the back of their head, and then you look slightly down. So I get in the elevator, and then they take it they take it up to the next floor. I don't know I don't know which floor because there's maybe 10 or 12 floors here. I don't know how many floors are in this building. And then they take me up to, they take me up to a, a, I don't know, just another cell. And so then I get in and I'm in two. Actually in the Man, look at all the ones in the room. Those ones are all the people, you know, if you're being honest, who've spent more than a day in jail. That is a lot of people. That's a lot of people. And were you get when you went to jail? Were you guilty of committing a crime, or were you innocent? Or two and then N two and like Nancy, where I was at right now. But before that, I was in two um, M or two O right next to the cell. So then I come into two M, and when I get in there, now I'm, I'm three days so far. Two three days, I think, and I'm wearing the same clothes. I stink. I've been doing hundreds and hundreds of push-ups, trying to keep my mind from wandering and counting them, so that you're, when you, I've done Wim Hof, I'm not sure if you, Wim Hof daily breathing exercise, it's 11 minutes, if you don't do it, I do it pretty frequently, and so I do Wim Hof several times during this process, but I stink, I stink horribly, it, it, I, I can smell myself, so finally when I get into 2N, or 2 2 M, I, I'm sorry, I think I'm in 2N now. And so then when I go in there, now I'm able to take a shower, but I have to put on the same clothes and the same underwear. I've actually washed my underwear twice because I've had the same pair of boxers for five days. Apparently they're having a laundry problem here at the facility, and so they don't know when. They said maybe next week we're going to get new clothes. I think today's Sunday, so next week I think starts tomorrow, Monday. I'm hoping that's what happens. And so then I go into... 2M, and when I get in there, it's a group of guys, and they're all about 25 to 35. I'm 49, so uh, I'm, in, I'm in pretty good shape. And, and, and so then we, we go out to the to the to the uh, rec room, which is maybe 20 feet wide by by 60 feet long, and it's just a, a concrete slab with a dip machine and a pull-up machine that are the same machine. Just pull up on one side, dips on the other. And so then uh, I work out with these guys who are young. These guys are doing sets of 20, 25 pull-ups. I'm managing like 8, 10. <laughs> I'm struggling because I haven't been doing a lot of pull-ups, and I'm absolutely starving. I've had very little food. The food, a lot of the food is simply not that bull. It's just not. So a couple people have put a little money on my commissary, and I'm so grateful you did it because I can buy some chili and I can buy some beans from the commissary, but I can only order once a week. So I had a friend. I, 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 this is a complicated story. I don't think I have any more time to tell the next story, but I just want you guys to know that I'm okay and I'm going to be all right. And uh, Yeah, there you go. Put a two in the room if you want to be a part of the Ann, the Judge and Zimmerman fan club we have a we have a, the most badass appeals attorney ever i haven't been able to talk to him i've called him three days in a row and i've left him voicemails and i i have powerful people who are writing letters of recommendation for me so if you're an attorney or if you're an officer at the court you can write a letter of recommendation vouching for me that i've had hundreds of police encounters and i've always preached nonviolence, always preached never to fight or shoot or attack police ever so this, uh, this judge was just completely out of her mind. And, and like I said, I took responsibility already and said I didn't do the best at comfort. So I don't belong in here. And uh, do I think that some people need to live in a box? Yeah, they're extraordinarily violent. They're mentally, they're criminally insane, and they need to live in a box. But mm-hmm. I was 95% of the people in this room, maybe 100% of these people, they need to go to a mandatory education Every 30 minutes should be an educational seminar that you learn on a computer where you're doing basic math, basic English structure or Spanish structure. Because when you learn English, Spanish, math, Russian, science, those things change the way the neurons in the brain work. John Locke said, show me the education of a man and I'll show you his character. Well, 
these mm-hmm. these characters are based that they're completely uneducated. A lot of these guys can't do basic algebra. And so they don't realize that what they're doing is going to have heavy consequences. They're going to be locked down. And so that's what this should be safe for. And this shouldn't be like this. You should have to go to 30 minutes of education every 30 minutes. And then the other 30 minutes, you should be in a regular facility where there's a toilet with toilet paper. That's another part, the the bathroom and the toilet paper and the way it works. I can't give it justice on the phone. I'm going to have to write it in the book. But the the, the way that it's, like I said, I already gave you the, gory details about the conversation Roy and I had, and it, it's just, mm-hmm. this is just not how you should treat another human being. Nobody here is learning a lesson. This is funding for the state and funding for the apparatus of the of the criminal injustice industry, and it's just so terrible. We, nobody's learning anything here, and the books are novels. Dan Brown's, uh, whatever it's called, I'm on the last 30 pages or 40 pages. And then I'm going to read Atlas Shrugged next. So it's just, so you're not learning anything. They're not creating new neurons in their brain, learning consequences because they learn basic algebra equation. Where's the computer screens where you learn basic math and basic English structure? Because those things actually teach you how to learn consequences. Where are the history yeah. lessons? Where are the, where are the riddles and rhymes you can solve right there in your own little cubicle where you have to learn and you have to pass this? And if you can't, then a virtual teacher comes on and says, "How are you? Why, why are you struggling, Chile? What's going on with you? I can't figure out why, you know, if E equals MC squared, why can't I get this into a quadratic formula? And then all of a sudden, my brain is working and I'm starting to engage in thinking. And that's what makes people less criminal when they can problem solve their way out of situations instead of doing criminal mm-hmm. activity. And that's what needs to change. Now, there's people who are freaking criminally insane that want to beat their wife senseless till they're almost dead, that want to rob the store and put a gun to their face. And let me tell you something. The guys in here have told me the truth. The guy looked at me and said, I was a criminal, dude. I was shooting up cocaine and then going into liquor stores and robbing them, putting a gun to the head, pistol whipping people. And that guy did almost 20 years in prison in New York. And now he's in here on a car dealing thing. And I said to him, I said, I said I'm not going to say his name right now, but I think the guy we're hearing in the background that's like responding to Chile a little bit is his assistant. If you're, if you're asking about that, I said to him, "Hey, you know, a." I said, "A, why, why are you doing this?" And he said, "I haven't been in prison in ten years. I'm fifty years old. I went to prison in my twenties and thirties. I got out and never did any that smack again. And I was just doing a petty card game. And he got arrested for a felony. And it's a hustle what he's doing. He told me straight up, Chile, I'm a con man." I have a stick. It's called a stick. It's called Three Card Monty. And, and mm-hmm. he showed me, he showed me, I, I bought him a deck of cards from my commissary and gave it to him because he's so talented with cards. And then here's the thing. If you get arrested and get a felony, then you can't do, you can't work in the casinos. And this guy's hands are just, you should see what he can do. But of course, he can't do it because if he does anything like that, he's going to go to prison. So yeah. I don't think he's going to ever get better. But there's ways to fix people if you give them enough education. And there's people who need to be taught careers. They can sit in here and learn plumbing on the new artificial intelligence 3D programming. You could teach people how to do plumbing and how to put pieces together simply by, by, by going through a, a, a virtual system with artificial intelligence that teaches them how to do plumbing. And then after they're in here for three months, they get out and they go work as an apprentice. There's people who learn here who do who could do heavy labor, who can do construction work. They could learn how to do concrete. They could learn how to do finishing. They could learn how to do H H H A V C air conditioning. They could learn how to do it here in here with virtual terminals using AI that shows them how the components work together while they're learning basic math, English, history, science. And then their brains are working again, and they're sober in here because you can't get drugs in here the way you can on the street. So a lot of these people who are in here, half of them because of drugs, no longer are going to be on drugs. One guy told me earlier, look, I'm a heroin addict. I take Suboxone, and and the Suboxone is the same as heroin. It's just a legal form Mm -hmm. of it. And if I don't get my shot of Suboxone every week, then I go crazy, and I lose my mind, and I break the law. Because I know once I break the law, I'm going to get my Suboxone again. He told me that. He he just, Mm -hmm. just told me that. So there's a, there's a, there could be a better system created if we focused it more on rehabilitating and educating people than punishing them. When we get locked down in our bunks, we're being punished. You will sit in your bunk for hours on end, and that's what you will do. The really weird part is that most of the guards in here 
already know who I am, and and I've had some. I don't I don't block trolls, Metal Mama. I understand people doing that. I just uh, I read what they say, and I kind of wonder. Well, I'll 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 finish this. There's only like two more minutes left. I'll finish this. Decent conversations with these guys. I'm I'm not going to go into too much detail about about the cards or or any details here with with any of them on the phone because my life depends on on not causing any kind of confrontation between myself and the guards. You know, and I, and I and I'm not confrontational at all. I've I've already read uh, Dan Brown's book called. Um, uh, Digital Fortress, I believe it's called, or something like that, about the NSA. I think he wrote it in 2000, the year before 9-11. And the book itself, when I read the book, it talks about how the NSA needs to have back doors and secrets into our into our computers. And you have one minute left. Dan Brown never pushes back and says, wait a minute, we, you know, he, he, he seems to have the slant that the NSA should have a back door into computers for our safety. So I, I my first Dan Brown novel. I'm, I'm not real impressed with him not pushing back on that. Anyway, that's the update for today. So um, I love you guys, and I'll check back in tomorrow. Hopefully, Brian from Here's the Deal can cover this. You guys can comment and stuff. And uh, thank you, Brian, for helping. And God bless you guys for helping me. I appreciate it. I have a GoFundMe if you guys can donate to that. That would be fantastic. All right, so I don't know about you, but I've heard enough of Chili's voice. The obvious thing here is that the scam is evolving. First, it was 25 grand. Now it's 50 grand. Who knows how much he'll be asking for tomorrow? And it's all a fraud because we know that no appellate lawyer is going to be able to resolve his case quick enough for it to matter in the first place. So thanks so much for watching. And by the way, protect yourself against doxing from frauditors by trying out Aura for free for 14 days by using my link in the description. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you guys on the next one. I live here!